Hi, everybody. It's beautiful outside today. Thought maybe I'd come outside and try to video out here. I'm coming to you to read the next chapter and number the stars, fourth graders. I hope you enjoyed that first chapter. This is such a great book. Um, remember that today we're going to talk about um, how characters or settings, how some of the details about those um, support the plot in the story. So this next chapter is called, Who is the Man Who Rides Past? It's not a really very long chapter. What I want you to be thinking about now is what the point is of this chapter. Tell me a story, Anne-Marie, begged Kirsty as she snuggled beside her sister in the big bed they shared. Tell me a fairy tale. Anne-Marie smiled and wrapped her arms around her little sister in the dark. All Danish children grew up with familiar, grew up familiar with fairy tales. Hans Christian Andersen, the most famous of the tale tellers, had been Danish himself. Do you want the one with about the Little Mermaid? That one had always been Anne Marie's favorite, own favorite. But Kirsty said no. Tell one that starts with a king and a queen, and they have a beautiful daughter. All right. Once upon a time there was a king. Anne Marie began. And a queen, whispered Kirsty. Don't forget the queen. And a queen. They lived together in a wonderful palace and. And was the place named Amalienburg? Kirsty asked sheepishly, sleepily. Shh, don't keep interrupting or I'll never finish the story. No, it wasn't Amalienburg. It was a pretend pal palace. Anne-Marie talked on making up a story of a king and queen and their beautiful daughter, Princess Kirsten. She sprinkled her tail with formal balls, fabulous gold-trimmed gowns, and feasts of pink frosted cupcakes until Kirsty's deep, even breathing told her that her sister was sound asleep. She stopped, waited for a moment, half expecting Kirsty to murmur, Then what happened? But Kirsty was still. Anne Marie's thoughts turned to the real king, Christian X, and the real palace, Amalienburg, where he lived in the center of Copenhagen. So remember, Copenhagen is um, where the story takes place in Denmark. How the people of Denmark loved King Christian. He was not like fairy tale kings who seemed to stand on balconies giving orders to subjects or who sat on golden thrones demanding to be entertained and looking for suitable husbands for their daughters. King Christian was a real human being, a man with a serious, kind face. She had seen him often when she was younger. Each morning he had come from the palace on his horse, Jubilee, and ridden alone through the streets of Copenhagen greeting his people. Sometimes, when Anne-Marie was a little girl, her older sister, Lisa, had taken her to stand on the sidewalk so that she could wave to King Christian. Sometimes he had waved back to the two of them and smiled. Now you are special forever, Lisa had told her once, because you have been greeted by a king. Anne-Marie turned her head on the pillow and stared through the partly open curtains of the window into the dim September night. Thinking of Lisa, her solemn, lovely sister always made her sad. So she turned her thoughts again to the king, who was still alive as Lisa was not. She remembered a story that Papa had told her shortly after the war began, shortly after Denmark had surrendered and the soldiers had moved in overnight to take their places on the corners. One evening, Papa had told her that earlier he was on an errand near his office standing on the corner waiting to cross the street when King Christian came by on his morning ride. One of the German soldiers had turned suddenly and asked a question of a teenage boy nearby. Who is that man who rides past here every morning on his horse? The German soldier had asked. Papa said he had smiled to himself, amused that the German soldier did not know. He listened while the boy answered. He is our king, the boy told the soldier. He is the king of Denmark. Where is his bodyguard? The soldier had asked. And, what, and do you know what the boy said? Papa had asked Anne-Marie. She was sitting on his lap. She was little then, only seven years old and she shook her head, waiting to hear the answer. The boy looked right at the soldier, and he said, All of Denmark is his bodyguard. Anne-Marie had shivered. It sounded like a very brave answer. Is it true, Papa, she asked, what the boy said? Papa thought for a moment. He always considered questions very carefully before he answered them. Yes, he said at last, it is true. Any Danish citizen would die for King Christian to protect him. You too, Papa? Yes. And Mama? Mama, too. Anne-Marie shivered again. Then I would, too, Papa, if I had to. Think about this for a minute. Why would the author go through that whole story of telling us about the people's reaction 
to the king. Um, in telling us how much the people loved the king and how much they were willing to protect him, the author is also giving us clues as to the closeness of these people and the extent to which they would go to protect, which is really pretty amazing. They sat silently for a moment. From across the room, Mama watched them, Anne Marie and Papa, and she smiled. Mama had been crocheting that evening three years ago, the lacy edging of a pillowcase, part of Lisa's trousseau. Her fingers moved rapidly, turning the thin white thread into an intricate, narrow border. Lisa was a grown-up girl of 18 then, about to be married to Peter Nielsen. When Lisa and Peter married, Mama said, Anne Marie and Kirsty would have a brother for the very first time. Papa, Anne Marie had said finally into the silence, sometimes I wonder why the king wasn't able to protect us. Why didn't he fight the Nazis so that they wouldn't come to Denmark with their guns? Papa sighed. We're such a tiny country, he said, and they are such an enormous enemy. Our king was wise. He knew how few soldiers Denmark had, and he knew that many, many Danish people would die if we fought. In Norway they fought, Anne Marie pointed out. Papa nodded. They fought very fiercely in Norway. They had those huge mountains for the Norwegian soldiers to hide in. Even so, Norway was crushed. In her mind, Anne Marie had pictured Norway as she remembered it from the map at school up above Denmark. Norway was pink on the school map. She imagined the pink strip of Norway crushed by a fist. Are there German soldiers in Norway now, the same as here? Yes, Papa said. In Holland, too? In Holland, too, Mama added from across the room, and Belgium and France. But not in Sweden, Anne Marie announced, proud that she, she knew so much about the world. Sweden was blue on the map, and she had seen Sweden, even though she had never been there. Standing behind Uncle Henrik's house, north of Copenhagen, she had looked across the water, the part of the North Sea that was called the Katgad, to the land on the other side. That is Sweden, you're seeing, Uncle Henrik had told her. You are looking across to another country. That's true, Papa has said. Sweden is still free. And now three years later, it was still true. But much else had changed. King Christian was getting old, and he had been badly injured last fall, last year in a fall from his horse, faithful old Jubilee, who had carried him around Copenhagen so many mornings. For days they thought he would die, and all of Denmark had mourned. But he hadn't. King Christian X was still alive. It was Lisa who was not. It was her tall, beautiful sister who had died in an accident two weeks before her wedding. In the blue carved trunk in the corner of this bedroom, Anne Marie could see its shape even in the dark. Anne Marie, I'm sorry, were folded Lisa's pillowcases with their crocheted edges, her wedding dress with its hand embroidered neckline, unworn, and the yellow dress that she had worn and danced in, with its full flying skirt at the party celebrating her engagement to Peter. Mama and Papa never spoke of Lisa. They never opened the trunk. But Anne Marie did from time to time when she was alone in the apartment. Alone, she touched Lisa's things gently, remembering her quiet, soft-spoken sister, who had looked forward, so forward, to marriage and children of her own. Red-headed Peter, her sister's fiancé, had not married anyone in the years since Lisa's death. He had changed a great deal. Once he had been like a fun-loving older brother to Anne Marie and Kirsty, teasing and tickling, always a source of foolishness and pranks. Now he still stopped by the apartment often, and his greetings to the girls were warm and smiling but he was usually in a hurry talking quickly to Mama and Papa about things Anne Marie didn't understand. He no longer sang the nonsense songs that had once made Anne Marie and Kirsty shriek with laughter, and he never lingered anymore. Lingered means to kind of hang around and talk for a little bit. Papa had changed too. He seemed much older and very tired, defeated. The whole world had changed. Only the fairy tales remained the same. And they lived happily ever after, Anne Marie recited, whispering into the dark, completing the tale for her sister, who slept beside her, one thumb in her mouth. And that's the end of that chapter. So it was called, Who is the Man Who Rides Past? I'm thinking that that's referring to the king. And the message that the author gives us about this character, the king, and about Anne Marie and the people of Denmark is that he was very much loved and they would do anything to protect him. So why would the author give us that message? 
I think because it tells us what kind of country this was. And so when the Germans have come in and threatened them, um, they're, they're terrified because um, they're afraid something's going to happen to them and to their beloved king. So next time, uh, the third chapter is called, Where is Mrs. Hirsch? So things are going to be picking up pretty soon. So think about um, the setting. So this country, the city, Copenhagen, think about the characters and think about how they relate to what's happening in the story. And also, if the characters were different or if the setting was different, do you think the plot would change? Something to think about. I will talk to you shortly. I'll be um, picking up the next chapter uh, in the next couple hours. See you later.